President uh, Ernesto Zedillo, Ambassador Rosalva Ojeda, Consul General of Mexico in Austin, Emeritus LBJ Professor and former Dean Rusk uh, hold, uh, Chairholder, Dr. Sidney Weintraub, Ambassador Robert Hutchings, Dean of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, colleagues and friends. My name is Peter Ward and on behalf of the LBJ School of Public Affairs and my fellow conference organizers, uh, Professor James Galbraith and Professor uh, Victoria Rodriguez, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all here this evening. Cold and unconscionably inhospitable, uh, the Austin weather is at the moment. Doubly welcome, therefore, to this, the inaugural event of the conference, NAFTA Plus 20, an assessment of intended and unintended consequences. The aim of this conference uh, is to explore and review some of the pros and cons of uh, NAFTA after 20 years, particularly with an eye to better understanding what still needs to be done uh, uh, in parts of the agreement and, and what might use, usefully be fine-tuned. I know that President Zadir will discuss these and other points in his keynote, and tomorrow, of course, we have the opportunity uh, of to, discuss, to dissect these issues further in a series of panels that are outlined in the opening page of your program. We look forward to seeing many of you through Friday, and let me say that in the event of a delayed opening of the university, or even its closure uh, for the day, please know that the show will go on as planned and as scheduled in the program. Before I turn to introduce our keynote speakers, may I first take this opportunity to further recognize uh, two special guests present today, and also to offer a preliminary vote of thanks. I mentioned uh, Dr. Sidney Weintraub in my initial greeting. I'm sure uh, all of you have heard his name and know many of his publications, especially those that have emerged since NAFTA began. Sidney Weintraub uh, came to the LBJ School in 1976 and was Professor and Dean Rusk Chairholder here until he joined uh, CSIS in Washington, D.C. in 1994. However, many of you may not have realized uh, that the idea of a possible free trade agreement between the USA and Mexico was already on his intellectual worry list uh, uh, at that, back at that time from the early 1980s. Specifically, in 1984, he published a seminal piece entitled Free Trade Between Mexico and the United States? Question mark. Truly visionary. Uh, his voice and his advocacy were key, both in the debates leading up to the passing of NAFTA and beyond uh, during its implementation. Many of us here will have the opportunity to honor Dr. Weintraub uh, tomorrow at lunch at a luncheon in his honor, but it's an enormous pleasure to welcome him back to the university and to the LBJ School in particular. I hope that many of you had an opportunity to see, of, uh, to see the photographic exhibit uh, as you entered the auditorium. It forms part of a major photographic uh, work by artist uh, Denai Stratu entitled The Globali Globalizing Wall. I say part since this, is, this part of the exhibit deals uh, specifically with the US-Mexico border viewed from both sides uh, as though you were looking uh, out through the windows of a car or a bus or a train as the world flashes by. If you squint your eyes a little and look to the right and left, uh, you're actually looking as uh, uh, the wraparound on the walls uh, as you come in is from the US side, and then the wraparound, the, the, uh, the booth at the back is are the, are the views that you might get from the, US, from the Mexico side. I'm delighted to introduce uh, uh, Danai Stratu to you today. Uh, Ms. Stratu currently lives in Austin pro bono, uh, both she and Ken Boyd from Yes Printing generously offered to mount this exhibition here in the Bass Lecture Theatre, especially for this conference. Denai will uh, talk further about her work when she appears on the panel about the border tomorrow afternoon. In the meantime, you will find further details about the exhibit uh, in the rear inside cover of the program booklet. Denai, please take a bow. In terms of uh, thanks, we need to thank, uh, first of all, Dean Robert Hutchings, who first prompted the three of us uh, to think about organizing this conference, uh, and then he provided uh, much of the support to make it happen. Uh, we also thank our colleagues at the LBJ School for their input, and especially to Ms. Uh, Lovedy Grossman, Director of Conferences and Training, 
and her team who've, uh, for handling all of the logistics. Thank you all. Now to this evening's lecture. After giving his keynote address, President Zadir will be joined in an armchair conversation and discussion uh, with Mr. Roger Wallace uh, and Professor James Galbraith, after which Dr. Galbraith will moderate questions from the audience. Uh, I, will interview, uh, I, will interview, I will introduce those two discussants uh, at that time. Once again, we are delighted to have President Ernesto Zidio back with us at the University of Texas at Austin. Currently, he is the Frederick Eisman 1974 Director of Yale University's Center for the Study of Globalization, where he is also a professor of international economics and politics. He earned his bachelor's degree at the National Polytechnic Institute in Mexico City, and subsequently his MA and his PhD degrees at Yale University. He serves on a wide range of international commissions and continues to publish widely on environmental and security issues. Prior to being elected uh, president of Mexico in 1994, he served in senior positions at the Central Bank of Mexico as budget undersecretary and then as secretary of programming and budget, and in 1992 was appointed secretary of education. Uh, he was president of Mexico, as you know, between 1994 and 2000, really the formative years of the implementation of uh, NAFTA. This evening, the title of his speech is NAFTA, Excellent, but not sufficient, and his remarks will undoubtedly presage much of our discussions over the next two days. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Ernesto Zidio to the podium. Thank you, Professor Peter Ward, for your welcome. Uh, I had a different idea of the English, English accent of uh, professors at the University of Texas. <laughs> so it was so, I was so impressed how you can imitate the accent of the British professors that I have heard before. Uh, well, <laughs> dear faculty members, uh, dear students, dear friends of the University of Texas at Austin, Madam Ambassador, dear friends, ladies uh, and gentlemen. I am really pleased to be part uh, of this conference. I truly thank uh, the organizers, uh, Professor Ward, Professor Rodriguez, uh, and certainly my uh, dear friend, highly esteemed uh, classmate and admired colleague, uh, I call him J.K. Galbraith, uh, Jamie Galbraith for me. Uh, for making me part uh, of this uh, very interesting, very promising, very exciting uh, conference. I am very pleased that uh, the organizers have uh, convened a very distinguished uh, group of uh, scholars and analysts of the NAFTA reality and certainly the reality of uh, my own country. I truly regret that uh, I will not be able to enjoy the conference as much as I would want, because I have to leave uh, tomorrow at 6 o'clock in the morning. Because speaking about trade, tomorrow I, I must host Pascal Lamy, the former director general of the WTO. So I will be missing what certainly uh, will be the better part of the proceedings of this uh, conference. I was uh, attracted to be a participant of this conference, not only because uh, my friends uh, invited me uh, to do it, but uh, of course for the general topic, and certainly because I found uh, the title of the conference uh, particularly provocative and exciting, you know, NAFTA plus uh, 20, an assessment of its uh, intended and unintended effects. And let me tell you, that's truly provocative uh, and challenging from an intellectual point of view for many reasons, certainly because we have to discuss really what were the intended uh, effects that those that, uh, who pursue NAFTA uh, 
really had in mind. Because after 20 years, well, everybody has his or her own particular story of why NAFTA was uh, launched, why NAFTA was uh, negotiated, why NAFTA was uh, implemented. And of course, the second part is uh, even more uh, challenging and, and provocative, the unintended consequences uh, or effects of NAFTA. So <clears throat> let me start, well, by sort of uh, saying that actually the objectives of uh, embarking of NAFTA were very well defined right at the outset. NAFTA was seen as a, an instrument that if uh, negotiated uh, could foster the trade and investment integration among the three partners, no more, no less than that. But of course, it was thought that uh, this should be an instrument that somehow could foster economic growth, uh, employment creation, and competitiveness in the three NAFTA partners. So. That should be, in my view, the first part of the discussion. Uh, and I would say, well, to some uh, respectable extent, what uh, the fathers of NAFTA had in mind has been accomplished. Because it cannot be denied at all that indeed our three economies have become significantly integrated, as proven by the fact that uh, trade among the three partners has uh, increased uh, fourfold in 20 years, and flows of uh, investment, uh, again, among the three partners, has increased uh, five times over the course of these two decades, and those are very objective indicators that indeed the integration that uh, was said to be pursued by NAFTA has been achieved in a significant way. The second part of the proposition, of course, is trickier, because when we say uh, we want to have more integration, so that uh, the three countries have better opportunities of growth, employment, and competitiveness, well, that's when we economists sort of move into a more difficult territory for very simple reason. Growth, employment creation, and com competitiveness are not uh, only a function of whether you are open to trade and investment. There are many other things happening at the same time. And it is not a, a trivial undertaking if we want to carry out this assessment, as suggested in the title of the conference, that we can control uh, for the impact of other things that are happening in terms of economic policy and otherwise in our societies. Still, uh, I would feel on a very safe ground if I would claim that overall the original objective of providing those growth and employment and competitiveness opportunities for our countries 
have indeed been achieved. Practically every serious exercise that I have seen about Mexico, once control for other variables is properly undertaken, show that indeed NAFTA has meant more economic growth than otherwise. That is to say, as we like to say as an economist, ceteris paribus. NAFTA has provided more and better jobs paid for Mexicans, and NAFTA has certainly made the Mexican economy a more competitive uh, one in the global economy. Uh, what about the United States? Well, for one thing, I am very confident that uh, that uh, very distinguished uh, entrepreneur from Texas that one day unfortunately decided to go into politics and who predicted or he said that the giant sucking sound of jobs leaving the U.S. into Mexico? Well, I think uh, that was not uh, the case. And although, given the large, immense size of the U.S. economy, the effects of NAFTA are not uh, as uh, meaningful quantitatively as in the case of Mexico, I think it will be very hard to prove that NAFTA, once you control for other factors, uh, has been a negative factor on the, US on the U.S. economy. And certainly about Canada, there was uh, never the fear, and I would say there has not been any evidence in the sense that uh, NAFTA proved to be negative uh, for Canada, but rather the opposite. And I insist all of this while our three economies have become increasingly integrated. Uh, I mentioned already uh, the figures of growth uh, in trade uh, and investment, but of course, what one could rely on other indicators, for example, the comparison of the trade that these economies uh, carry out with great regions as uh, uh, Asia or Europe. And in that comparison, you will find, of course, that our trade, trade among ourselves, is considerably more important than the trade that we carry out with other uh, engines of the global economy. And not only that, but there is much more value added in the trade that these three partners carry out among themselves. So the assessment in my view, of the intended effects should be overall, on balance, uh, positive. Now, sometimes this uh, assessment is made uh, against objectives that actually were never really part, part of the plan. And I think this is when the more uh, touchy and controversial discussion uh, can start. Uh, but I would claim, and this is uh, in defense of uh, my profession, and in particular, in defense of those like myself who are deep believers in the value of free international trade for the sake not only of uh, human material prosperity, but also for the sake of international peace uh, 
and security that actually we economists for a long time have uh, said, entertained, proved, and shown that trade does have other consequences, including those in income distribution. You don't have to be a, a revisionist or heterodox uh, economist to remember that uh, the fathers of modern international trade many, many years, years ago, if I remember well my trade theory, which I should remember because sometimes I teach that, uh, some semesters. Uh, well, it was in the late 1930s when uh, one of the fathers of that modern trade uh, theory, Professor Paul Samuelson, who put in very elegant terms, Hector Olin theory of international trade, uh, produced a small paper uh, with very highly simplified assumptions, which is a merit in this case, along with another professor, Professor Stolper, and they presented what eventually came to be known as the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, as, uh, as I tell my students in a less pretentious way, the Stolper-Samuelson proposition. But in a very simple, elegant way, it is shown that every time you do international trade, you will have consequences in income distribution. But also from our theory, we know that there are other instruments in economic policy that in principle could be used to compensate those that uh, could potentially be losers in this process of opening up to international trade. And I use this uh, digression because um, at least in the case of Mexico, it is uh, only fair to recognize that uh, people who like, uh, for good reason, to observe and study what has happened to NAFTA, it typically point to the fact, not only potential distributional consequences of NAFTA, uh, but also they point to the very fundamental fact that during the 20 years of existence of NAFTA, Mexico's per capita income has failed to converge towards the other NAFTA partners per capita income. And this is an indicator that uh, development economics, economists like uh, to look at. This is a very basic question. The basic question is, OK, a country that is in the pursuit of development, does it have its per capita income converging towards the per capita income of at least those countries with which uh, their citizens like that comparison to make? And of course, the United States for us is a significant point of reference. And in this specific case of Mexico, over the last 20 years, yes, we must admit that we haven't had that convergence towards the per capita income of the United States. That is unquestionably a fact. Now, the next step, which uh, is frequently taken by some of these analysts, 
is to conclude that given that we have failed to achieve that convergence, then we must conclude not only because uh, potential negative distributional consequences, but uh, even more clearly in their view, because NAFTA has not produced the convergence that uh, in their view was uh, the main uh, purpose or intention of NAFTA. And this is where we get really to the interesting point of the discussion. Because uh, as I said right at the outset, it is very difficult, and in fact not only difficult, but incorrect to try to establish uh, that kind of relationship between the use of trade policy instruments and the overall performance of an economy without taking into account what else is happening in that economy. Or more importantly, without specifying, and this in reference to the Mexican case, what is not happening or what hasn't happened in the Mexican economy during the lifespan of NAFTA, which is really what, uh, in my view, constitutes the relevant discussion. And this takes me back to my claim before. My claim before is NAFTA was seen basically as an instrument of economic uh, integration. But uh, certainly people, at least from the part of Mexico, that were committed towards NAFTA, were very aware that if we wanted to achieve that economic convergence towards the United States levels of per capita income, if we wanted to reduce uh, at a quicker pace rates of poverty in our country, if we wanted to reduce the severe income inequality that has characterized my country for too long, other important reforms, not only economic, but also institutional, would have to be carried out in the pursuit of those objectives. And even a superficial analysis of what's happened will show you that after the initial impulses of the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the reform drive, I would say, the economic reform drive in my country sort of slowed down and at some point truly got stalled. I would say that's certainly uh, bad news because in my view, we are still paying the consequences of not having continued pursuing as vigorously as at some point we did this process of reform. But actually, there is uh, also some of a positive news about that fact. And the fact is that uh, along with that uh, process of economic reform, my country moved also vigorously into a process of political reform. It has been now a number of years where we Mexicans can claim with uh, a lot of uh, confidence, with a lot of uh, certainty, and I would hope that with some pride, uh, 
that we live in a vigorous, uh, highly competitive democracy. And uh, that is, I think, uh, very important. Uh, that is quite uh, an achievement. But that also poses challenges. And one evident challenge is the fact that since at least 1997, my country, not unlike other democracies, not unlike this democracy here in the United States, has had a divided government. Because since 1997, the executive branch of government has not uh, enjoyed the comfort of having his party with an absolute majority in Congress. And that has certain practical consequences in terms of uh, governance, uh, which some people would say that they are bad, inconvenient, but others believe, and I am among uh, one of them, that ultimately this is, or this has been, a positive evolution for my country. Because democracy, among other things that you know well, is about checks and balances. And sometimes those checks and balances prevent moving faster when you are trying to do good things. But more importantly, those checks and balances slow down you, fortunately, when you are trying to do not so good things. And I would say, given Mexico's history, I would say that it is very fortunate that now we can enjoy the benefit, the privilege of having those uh, check and balances. And the cost that we have paid in terms of uh, the difficulty that we face to achieve the necessary consensus for carrying out uh, certain reforms is a relatively minor cost, provided that we are confident, of course, that our democracy is uh, progressing, is uh, maturing in a way that uh, little by little, irrespective of uh, partisan uh, militancies, ideological differences, uh, political forces, in my country converge towards the indispensa indispensable agreements. And I do submit to you today that Mexico seems to be approaching that point of democratic maturity. We look at what has happened over the last year and I believe this has probably has to do with the party that uh, returned to power. But I would say, and I would give also enormous merit uh, to, parties, to parties different than mine. I think everybody has gone through this process, sometimes frustrating process, but I think at the end, uh, all of the political stakeholders have understood that the game of democracy in Mexico has become a very serious game. Serious alternance in power and where therefore all of us are responsible uh, to build and to protect the house because now is not determined beforehand who is going to be the head of that house? Because everybody who has decided to participate in politics knows that his or her own party has an opportunity to have that responsibility. 
And I think the fact that this has become more and more part uh, of the awareness and the political culture is really what has allowed political forces in my country over the last uh, year or so to achieve uh, agreements that uh, only a few years ago uh, were not only impossible, but even inconceivable to tackle. And this is how we have seen, in fact, in the transition of the governments from President Calderon to President Peña Nieto, a labor reform, which I think uh, eventually will prove to be uh, significant, if not yet perhaps uh, uh, sufficient. It is also the way in which we have seen a major constitutional reform and legal reform to give new foundations to our educational system. It is how we have seen a very important reform, and I know that this will be discussed tomorrow, uh, to rebuild, uh, to give a new structure uh, to our telecommunications sector. It is how we have also seen the fundamental agreement of uh, new competition rules. Uh, it is also the way in which, unfortunately, not with the participation of every major uh, political force uh, in Mexico, but uh, with a significant uh, majority, the necessary majority, a very important reform or the foundations of a very important reform in the energy sector. And all of this makes me think that uh, the process that was envisioned back in the 1980s and in the 1990s to pursue the modernization of the Mexican economy somehow is a process that is back on track. And that it is only now that uh, we will see that uh, this uh, construction towards economic integration can indeed materialize in the economic growth and the other economic and social consequences that were at least in the back of the mind of the people who envisioned the negotiation and the enactment of NAFTA. I must admit that there is not full certainty about that. Because for one thing, when I have uh, spoken about the reforms uh, adopted over the last year, uh, we still have to talk and acknowledge that the execution of those reforms is not a minor undertaking. And more frequently than that, I must admit, uh, our own political systems, and I mean in Latin America, uh, have not been particularly good at execution. I, I hope that uh, this time execution is uh, better than in the past. But more importantly, I think, is that the task of reforming the structure of our economy is not yet complete. There are still uh, a number of aspects that will have to be tackled if we really want to have the rates of economic growth and poverty reduction 
that we all want to have. Even in those aspects that had been touched upon by the recent reforms, we still have significant pending tasks. Let's take education. Even if we assume that the reform uh, enacted by our Congress is well executed, it only touches upon one part of the educational sector. We still we would still have a lot to do in um, higher education, for example. Not to speak about other policies that we need to undertake to make the educational system even more inclusive and capable of delivering higher quality in its, outco in its outcomes. We have, and this is very important, a very serious problem of duality in our economy. We have, and perhaps this is the highest in Latin America, the highest percentage of our labor force employed in this, in this so-called informal sector of the economy. Almost 60% of our economically active population, labor force, is employed in the informal sector of the economy. And this is a very serious problem, because almost by definition, you are employed in the informal sector of the economy, you are bound to have a very low productivity. Right? Uh, and that's a very bad news. Because as long as we have our people employed in the informal sector of the economy, the capacity of the economy to grow will be significantly limited. Now, the good news could be that this duality is not a fatality. It's not a geographic fatality. It's not a cultural fatality. It's not a social fatality. It is actually a man-made, policy-made fatality. And that has a remedy. And why do I say that? Well, it's very obvious, the evidence. Uh, we tax heavily employment in the formal sector of the economy, and particularly in the recent decade, uh, but uh, certainly before, we tend to somehow subsidize employment in the informal sector of the economy so that there is a significant wage difference uh, between the cost of being employed or employing in the formal sector or in the informal sector. Some economies will estimate that gap around 30%. And that is huge. As long as you, that, that you have that gap, it is only natural that the economy will tend to employ more people in the informal sector of the economy. And correcting this, of course, has to do with uh, tax policy, social security policy, uh, financial policy, uh, and, and other important institutional reforms that, however difficult to make, are possible to make. And I think that is a fundamental undertaking that has to be taken in the next uh, few years. And I could go on and on and on with problems that I still have to tackle, to be tackled by important reforms. But when I am pushed to say, OK, Cedillo, admit that uh, political and economic capital 
is everywhere limited and bounded. Where would you spend your last peso, or you wish, your last dollar of political capital if you want to have an effect on Mexico's development? Or put it in more uh, brutal terms, tell me what is the main obstacle for Mexico to fully develop? What is your main weakness that you believe needs to be fixed? For me, the answer is very simple. And I, when I am asked that kind of question, I like to dramatize it by saying Mexico has three problems. One is weak rule of law. Two is weak rule of law and three is weak rule of law. So where would I expend my last peso, my last uh, capacity to pursue Mexico's development, addressing the weaknesses that we still have in that front? Because whether we like it or not, and we don't like it, of course, uh, our legal system or our comprehensive system to enforce the rule of law still has significant weaknesses. And one way to illustrate this or to, to make the point about this is simply by making reference to the very basic question of whether the fundamental principle of equality before the law is in Mexico the rule or the exception. And I am afraid that the answer is that the principle of equality before the law is not the rule under which the system operates. And what I say when I am given, or when I take the opportunity of uh, expressing uh, my views on the challenges of Mexico's uh, development, this is the point I always insist. Listen, we can do further opening of our economy. We can do marvelous educational reform, competition reform, put on paper a better tax system. But if we fail to reform and strengthen rule of law in our country, then everything else will not fail, but will not serve fully its purpose. So in my view, dear friends, uh, my, I tried to, to, to make it provocative when they say, how are you going to, to call your talk? I said, well, you know, NAFTA, excellent, because I believe that NAFTA was uh, an excellent uh, initiative. I believe that NAFTA has other things equal, deliver well. But when I say sufficient, I mean that uh, we Mexicans still have a lot of homework to do. Thank you very much.
much indeed, uh, President Zadio, for that uh, excellent speech. And uh, we now have an opportunity to open it up. It speech, it was a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Don't diminish me. <laughs> we have too many lectures here. We enjoy oh, speeches okay. more. Um, we now have an opportunity for conversation, a sort of a fireside chat conversation. You're going to have to imagine the fireside, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our two uh, discussants, uh, conversants. Mr. Roger uh, Wallace is uh, uh, Vice President of uh, Federal Policy at the Pioneer Natural Resources. He served as chair of the Mexico Center's advisory board here at uh, the Teresa Long uh, Institute of Latin American Studies, and currently is the co-chair uh, of the Woodrow Wilson Center's uh, Mexico Institute advisory board in Washington, D.C. Between 1991 and 1993, Roger Wallace was Minister Counselor for Commerce at, at the United States Embassy in Mexico, and prior to that, he was Deputy Under Secretary of International Trade at the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce and was intimately involved, therefore, in the preparatory phases leading up to NAFTA. And then, of course, my colleague, uh, Professor James Galbraith, uh, here at the LBJ School, he holds the Lloyd Benson, Jr. Chair of Government Business Relations. Uh, he is internationally recognized and decorated uh, for his work on inequality. In November last year, in this very room, he organized a very, very successful conference on the Eurozone crisis. And like President Zidio, he also received his PhD from Yale University. Indeed, as you've already heard, uh, their student days uh, overlapped at that time. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Roger uh, to lead off, and then James Galbraith will continue, and uh, Dr. Galbraith will moderate a Q&A uh, after that initial conversation. Not fair, they have a mic. <laughs> <laughs> that can be remedied. This is, this is the way you treat uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, that's uh, your mic. Oh, thank you. President Zito, again, thank you very much for, for being here with us today and for that excellent speech, lecture. Um, you know, there were a couple of things that were not in the original NAFTA. Mexico reserved the energy question. The United States reserved the um, migration question. I think actually Canada reserved the culture question. And uh, we've heard a lot over the last few years about the immigration issue. Uh, we heard some about the energy issue, which you mentioned today, which Mexico has made, a, we think, a potentially great stride. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, immigration, but not in the traditional way. Uh, you know, in some ways, we have kind of horizontal uh, immigration across borders and everything. But something you alluded to, I think, is a really big problem for at least two of the three countries in the NAFTA is what I'd call vertical integration. And it's this economic uh, mobility in our countries. And I know you've given a lot of thought to human capital, the cost of human capital. And I'd like for you just to give us some of your thoughts about, first, how countries can address this issue. And if we do address these issues successfully, what impact does it have on our sort of uh, our economic competitive competitiveness as a free trading area? Well, uh, I think I need to perhaps ask you a little bit more because you spoke about vertical integration, which for economies, particularly those in industrial organization and microeconomics mean something. And then you spoke about uh, mobility. Uh, so I guess you are talking more about uh, the social mobility that may happen as a consequence of uh, economic development uh, under particular circumstances. But what I meant to say was, was vertical immigration, uh, immigrating from one social level, economic level to another. Yeah, uh, that's a mobility, a social right. mobility. Well, uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting topic, you know, which uh, tortures the mind of uh, Economist, uh, it's a quantitative challenge because there is not a single way to, to measure it. But uh, I think that it is clear that uh, economic growth uh, is, in principle, uh, a most effective way to uh, promote uh, mobility as long as this process of economic growth is uh, founded on, uh, I would say, very robust processes 
to make sure that uh, there is a quality of opportunity across uh, your society. And I think uh, people are bothered in this country, uh, but perhaps also um, in Mexico, by the fact that in the best of cases, social mobility has not improved over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, although I read an article this week or last week in The Economist uh, quoting uh, a technical contribution, you know, saying that actually there has been a little bit more of social mobility in this country. But it, again, it can be very arbitrary. What I am very confident is that uh, in the case of Mexico, if we don't have higher economic growth, uh, we have no chance to improve significantly uh, this uh, mobility and our pace of reducing poverty, which was, has not been insignificant over the last decade, by the way, uh, and also our capacity to improve uh, income distribution will also be limited. Now, it is also true that it is uh, harder to achieve a higher economic growth if you start with a very unequal society. Uh, you must have well-defined, well-targeted interventions to equalize opportunities within your society. And of course, one uh, instrument which is uh, uh, indispensable is the question of education. And in that respect, I think uh, if you look at Mexico, but also if you look at uh, the United States, it will be very hard to say that uh, the level playing field is uh, really even. Because depending where you are born, depending on your uh, parents or your single mother or single father, uh, economic and social condition, that uh, sort of predetermines whether you will have access to a system of education that will really give you uh, equal opportunity to compete in the market uh, economy. Uh, and I think uh, at your level here in the United States, uh, with much more resources, but also at our level, I think this uh, equality of opportunities or lack of equality of opportunities must be recognized, not only something that must be tackled as a matter of social justice, which I believe is pursuing social justice, but also as a matter to pursue faster economic growth. Uh, well, let me first of all say, Mr. President, that it's a great pleasure. For you, I am Ernesto. Ernesto. <laughs> yeah, you are not much younger than me, OK? That is true. And I have more hair. We than are, you. however, in a we formal were, setting, school. <laughs> and an American always addresses a president as Mr. President. Besides which, it's a pleasure for me to do that. <laughs> we have had an academic trajectory that started out together. It's overlapped on a few occasions since then, and it's a, it's a, it's a treat for me to be able to welcome you here to a place that I've made my home for almost 30 years. Uh, I want to just pursue the line of questioning that Roger uh, started with respect to the capacity to achieve greater uh, equality of opportunity as the foundation for economic growth. Uh, and I'll toss out just a, a, a very short argument of kind of devil's advocacy. Uh, the last decade was pretty good in much of Latin America, particularly in South America. 
strong energy prices uh, and the strengthening of social institutions in quite a number of countries and reduction of poverty. And some of that also has happened. Uh, and Mexico is part of that. Uh, but if you look forward, uh, I can see, in, particularly in the Mexican uh, condition, three or four external issues. One is that uh, uh, in the manufacturing sector, which was greatly expanded as a result of trade in the United, with the United States, there's now the uninvited guest, uh, as it's been described, of China, which has been eroding that strata of the manufacturing sector in, in North America. Uh, in agriculture, uh, Mexico now imports about a third of its cereals from the United States. So that sector was, one could argue, weakened substantially by the, by the opening up of trade. Uh, in petroleum, the effect of the reforms that you discussed may be to uh, improve the efficiency of the Mexican energy industry, but at the same time, to make it harder for the state to tap those resources. And so I'm wondering where one gets, where you see the most, the sectors that will provide the dynamism that would give the Mexican society the ability to meet the demand for improved opportunity. You... Well, um, first, let me agree with you that uh, when one looks at Latin America, the last decade, uh, at least the big numbers, uh, look good. And that that uh, performance and this is not, uh, at least not until recently, recognized, uh, particularly <coughs> in South America, has to do a lot with what happened in Asia, particularly in China. Uh, Latin America, for the first time in many decades, has had a very positive external shock, you know. Uh, increasing demand for commodities at better prices. I don't want to diminish the merit or more responsible economic and social policies in our countries, but I think it has been uh, overlooked that somehow, you know, the success of countries uh, like Brazil or Argentina uh, have been uh, uh, achieved on the shoulders of China. But China will not have these uh, fantastic rates of economic growth that they have had in the last 20 years forever. And in fact, we are beginning to see uh, a slower, although still impressively high, uh, economic growth in China. Having said that, however, the case of Mexico has been a little bit different in two respects. One, we haven't had as high growth as the Perus, the Colombias, the Argentinas, uh, and not only close to Brazil, but not uh, quite there, simply because we are not a commodity exporter, a significant commodity exporter. Uh, is that bad news or good news? I would say, actually, it's a very good news. Because we used to have an extreme dependence uh, for our balance of payments on oil, which uh, fortunately disappeared with uh, the opening up of the Mexican economy. Now we are a manufacturing, exporting country. And we have been like that for several years. And for us, China was a negative shock, yes. particularly with the accession of China to the WTO. But news, the good news is that now, as China has grown more and real wages have go, grown more, uh, uh, without Mexico doing nothing extraordinary, we are becoming, a, again, uh, competitive. And actually, in Mexico completes the homework, I think there is no reason why we should not be considerably more competitive than China and to continue being 
a significant partner of the United States and Canada, particularly in reference of production of manufacturers and uh, continued engagement in this process of uh, globalization. So I think there is there a potential engine for growth uh, for the Mexican economy. Uh, I think the it, domestic market, uh, if we complete the process of reforms, is uh, bound to continue expanding, and I will do it at a faster rate. I think there are some sectors in the Mexican economy, and tomorrow, uh, fortunately, better people or more knowledgeable people than myself will be speaking about that. But it is evident that we have an underdeveloped, just to give you an example, because I know that it will be talk about tomorrow, a, a telecommunication sector that is uh, underdeveloped by many standards. Uh, certainly, we have an energy sector. I'm not so sure that the reforms that have been adopted, well, I am sure that the reforms that have been adopted will diminish the capacity of the Mexican government uh, to tap the oil rent. On the contrary, I think now with this reform, if it is properly implemented, uh, the Mexican state will have a higher capacity to use uh, the energy sector as an instrument for Mexico's uh, economic development. But we need to have an intelligent design for this opening up to private investment. In a way, we have an advantage, which historically was a disadvantage, and that is that we are a late comer. Because now we have not only the Mexican experience, but we have the experience of the Norways of this world and other countries that rather intelligently have opened up or have had traditionally private investment into the energy sector and have been able to capture a significant part of the, in the case of the oil sector, of the oil rent. But the government has to be very careful, has to be very transparent, it has to be very clear rules and a very rigorous execution of those rules. So I don't see you know, a lack of engines of growth uh, for the Mexican economy. What I see are still obstacles, as I mentioned in my speech, uh, uh, to tap uh, those, uh, uh, the full potential of those uh, engines of growth. I'd like to return just uh, to your spending your last political peso on uh, judicial reform, um, there's a, well, there's a uh, rule of law. There is a judicial reform that's slowly progressing through the system, I understand. But uh, what, air, what, what gives you optimism that, that Mexico can, can really accomplish this task of, of establishing a strong rule of law? Well, I didn't say that I was optimistic. Uh, and second, I didn't say only judicial reform. I say no, rule of law. Rule of law. You know, uh, because this is important. Uh, the first reform that uh, the government did when I, or pursued when I became president, was uh, the reform of the federal judiciary. Uh, we made sure, for the first time in our history, that we will have an independent federal judiciary, and we achieved that. And I can say today, it was clearly not enough. Uh, we had to do, and we need to do much more than that, because rule of law is not only about the federal judiciary or only about the Supreme Court. It's about the entire judiciary, federal and state judiciaries. It's about uh, your attorney uh, general offices at the federal level and the local level. It's about your police. Uh, it's about the culture. I mean, it's a very complex system. Now, uh, I believe that it is possible to, to reform it, but it has to be placed really at the top of the priority, uh, not only from the part of the government, 
but also from the part of the society. And everybody must be willing to do what it takes to have uh, effective, fair, uh, unquestionable uh, rule of law. And that requires not only a good design, but also requires uh, resources. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is, uh, is very important. We cannot uh, create this rule of law on the chip. It's going to take several percentage points of GDP uh, to put in place the right institutions, the right human resources, uh, and all the elements that are needed for this uh, endeavor. I think the first step is to have this social awareness and commitment, uh, both from political actors, but I insist, both pro, also from society, that this is very important uh, for everybody, uh, and that this needs an effort from everybody. Uh, for very good reason, uh, people in my country uh, do complain about weaknesses in our security and our weak rule of law. And uh, you have seen all these social movements, you know, uh, for good reason, protesting about, against uh, this uh, failure in our system. Uh, what I sometimes think and say to some friends, well, you know, one day I would love to see a demonstration telling the government, okay, government, increase my taxes as long as you put that into rule of law. But I never heard that. <laughs> when I hear that, I will be very optimistic. Can I take advantage of your presence here to ask you a question on a, on a broader subject? I was at uh, a conference on the same theme at UNAM about a week ago. And one of the participants, a distinguished Mexican professor, made the comment that the NAFTA was a foundational agreement. In particular, it laid, uh, set down a framework for the way in which certain kinds of uh, international uh, economic relations with, would, would be conducted, adjudication of disputes over what are called property rights, patent protections, uh, the role of transnational corporations and the recourse that investors have and so forth before international bodies. Now, on the other hand, was a reasonably compact negotiation, just three countries, with a reasonably clear purpose, in part, being to create in North America something that would be a comparable entity, not, near, not reproducing, but comparable to the European Union or the emerge, then emerging Eurozone. What we have now is an ongoing set of negotiations for which uh, NAFTA is sometimes referred to as a model, Trans-Pacific Partnership, Transatlantic Partnership, rather sprawling negotiations involving what might appear to be a fairly arbitrary set of countries, at least at first, over a whole spectrum of questions very deeply obscure uh, and kept from public view, so it's hard to discuss what's going on in particular. Our friend Joe Stiglitz has been harshly critical of this process. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have a view as to whether uh, we have reached a point where we are now doing things for perhaps political purposes uh, that do not necessarily comport with the, object, with the grand objective that you spoke of earlier of achieving a freer uh, uh, and more integrated global economy. Well, very, very good question, mm -hmm. and it will, it's a subject not for one, for, for many conferences, mm -hmm. but I will try to, to make a few points. Uh, first, uh, let me be very transparent, uh, and that is that I am a true believer in a multilateral system. Uh, in my ideal world, I would like to see a world of free trade, but among all nations, even in Mexico, loses preferences, <laughs> right? Uh, because regional agreements, uh, which some people call preferential trade agreements, or regional trade agreements, we can call them DTAs, which are discriminatory trade agreements. That's what 
NAFTA and the European Union uh, are all about, because mm -hmm. we always are discriminating against third parties. In my ideal world, uh, we should pursue a world with uh, no trade barriers for every country. But this is, of course, an, an ideal, which unfortunately we are not uh, yet there and probably will take uh, a long time. And if you don't believe me, look what has happened with the Doha round. It was launched in November of 2001, that is to say 12 years ago. And today we can say with all certainty, and in my case with all sadness, that the Doha round has been a failure. And it wasn't a terribly ambitious uh, undertaking. It had still uh, to be seen as one more step towards that universal, uh, full reciprocity, non-discriminatory regime of free trade uh, in the world. Uh, having said that, well, the, there is a question uh, raised uh, many years ago whether these uh, regional trade agreements, uh, which are really a second or third best, uh, will constitute uh, eventually a building block or a stumbling block towards the truly multilateral uh, uh, liberal uh, trade regime. And I would say that the coin is in the air. I think that when NAFTA was uh, negotiated, uh, somehow NAFTA was a stimulus uh, to conclude the Uruguay round. Uh, and that was very good. Probably without NAFTA, it would have been uh, either a longer term or even impossible to conclude uh, the, the Uruguay round, which I think was good overall for, for those uh, involved. I'm not so sure that I will say the same about recent undertakings. Those that have been concluded in other parts of the world, uh, nor would I say that with confidence about the TPP or the projected uh, transatlantic uh, agreement. I think uh, that there is a very serious risk that these uh, other undertakings uh, have, uh, are taking attention, political capital of the more fundamental multilateral endeavor. And in fact, I am afraid that if these uh, negotiations are um, captured by interest that de-emphasize de -emphasize market access and try to pursue other objectives, then they have a very high probability uh, to fail. So I would say the coin is uh, in the air and my own preference will be to emphasize the multilateral rather than the regional. I, I have one final before we go to the, to the audience. You spoke at the uh, beginning about, or in the middle of your lecture about um, convergence and the absence of convergence of basically Mexico not being able to rise toward the living standards of the United States. And there's another aspect of this question of convergence. Um, there, and this emerges from our generation, really, um, that uh, the governing uh, personalities in Mexico uh, have had an extraordinarily high standard of uh, economic education. And I think it's fair to say no one will dispute that uh, Yale University is the predominant uh, institution in that respect. Yeah, um, that uh, although, but I will MIT, say, Chicago, I, I will, I will say, I will say, out of um, a spirit of generosity, that some of the ones you mentioned, Harvard, MIT, Chicago, Stanford, perhaps even Princeton, have played some role in this. That's not my question. My question is. Uh, given the starting differential between the uh, 
leadership of Mexico in this respect and the leadership of the United States. Do you see any sign or any hope of the possibility of convergence of the United States toward the Mexican standard? <laughs> uh, if you believe that uh, Professor Galbraith <laughs> has become a troublemaker with age, you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> he has been all along very consistent. Uh, and he wants to get me into trouble. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I have seen, with some exceptions, very high quality in the leadership of the United States, Jamie. Uh, I have no doubt about it. And actually, you know, uh, having a degree from, um, from an Ivy League never guarantees that a person is going to do well in government. It helps. But I think uh, there are other circumstances, uh, conditions, uh, convictions, and ethics that uh, make a big difference. But certainly having a, an Ivy League education sometimes helps. Now, let me just add a footnote to that. I remember during the negotiations, uh, the, the word asymmetry kept coming up. You know, the asymmetry between the United States and Mexico. And a number of us kept saying, yes, but there was an asymmetry between the Mexican negotiating team and the US negotiating team, with the asymmetry being on the Mexican side, not on the US side. Well, you know, not really. I mean, it, it, I have uh, become uh, uh, a very good friend, uh, for example, of uh, Carla Hills. She's great. Uh, she's absolutely great, actually. She is a Yale graduate again. I apologize for that. <laughs> but she studied law. Uh, but she is such an incredible intellect. And, uh, uh, and she has the best of two worlds because she was trained in law. But she uh, is uh, somebody who understands and, uh, economics and actually articulates economics certainly much better than me. I mean, when I want to hear a clear explanation about a complex uh, economic issue, you know, I, I ask Carla to, to explain it because she has this incredible capacity. So you Americans stop playing that car. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> you know, we are not going to fall into that trap. Every time we go into a negotiation with uh, US counterparts, we know that we are dealing with uh, top people no matter what. And you are another example, no. uh, <laughs> Royer, OK? Shall we go to the? I'm sorry, Peter? You're the. Uh, All right, so we go to the audience now. Yeah, All right, we. So it's open to the floor. Oh, would yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Are the masters of ceremony. I think we have a gentleman here who'd like to ask a question. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Señor Presidente, it's an honor for me to be tonight here in this um, uh, lecture. Uh, I have a, a question. You, you, well, NAFTA was created principally as uh, for trade. And uh, today we see that there are types of agreements and partnerships going on around the world as well. And basically, today we're celebrating, or we have accomplished 20 years after the creation of NAFTA. What uh, is your opinion on what's going to happen to NAFTA in the next 20 years? Well, um, first, because of other agreements that uh, the United States and Canada have uh, uh, agreed with other countries, we must recognize that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the NAFTA that was negotiated in the early 90s, uh, preferences that Mexico enjoy have been eroded. Because now the US has free trade agreements with Central America, with uh, Colombia, with Peru, uh, with Chile, uh, and is negotiating with other parts of the world. 
So that's first a step that we Mexicans should not continue sleeping, how do you say, in, in, on our laurels, uh, uh, because actually those preferences have been uh, eroding. So that should be a further stimulus to reinvigorate the process of reform in Mexico, because we will have less of the trade and investment card that we had before, so we need more uh, domestic uh, strength to pursue economic growth. Now, uh, we can also talk, although I don't know whether political circumstances, particularly in this country, uh, will allow it, uh, whether uh, NAFTA uh, among the existing members can be enhanced. And there are ideas that have been put uh, on the table. Uh, some people have spoken about the, the possibility of a common market, but of course we know that there is the issue of uh, uh, labor for our movement that will pose a serious problem, but at least we could aim for a common tariff that would allow us to get rid of this extremely cumbersome and I believe inconvenient uh, rules of origin. Some people have spoken about uh, agreements to enhance integration in particular sectors of our economies, not least uh, uh, sectors like uh, telecommunications. So I think there is a full catalog of uh, options, but uh, I am a bit uh, uh, skeptical that uh, there are the political circumstances uh, in this country. I, I get a little bit dismay when uh, a rather relatively modest uh, endeavor, because I think it's rather modest endeavor, as a TPP, uh, or in past years, you know, free trade agreement with Colombia, I mean, or with Peru, was a matter of such a big controversy in this country. It's absolutely sad that a country that has uh, uh, built its uh, economic, uh, uh, impressive economic uh, performance on the principles of free markets and open markets you still hear an argument like the ones we have heard in past years, or we are hearing today when even uh, distinguished members of the uh, president's party say, oh, don't even talk about fast track uh, authority. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very worrisome. Uh, therefore, I'm not terribly optimistic that any time soon uh, and I hope when the three presidents, I mean, the prime minister of Canada and the two presidents of Mexico and the United States get together in a few days, I wish they will prove me uh, wrong, but uh, I am afraid that uh, on this, I will be right. Rafael Fernandez de Castro. Speaking of, I, of distinguished <laughs> uh, graduates of an American university. I, in fact, am pleased to introduce my very first student at the University of Texas. <laughs> You're very kind, Jamie. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I also was a student of Cindy Weintraub that we're honoring tomorrow. And uh, I have a question for you, President Cedillo. I, uh, I mean, nobody doubts that America has become now un more uneven uh, in, the, in his last address of the Union. President Obama kept on referring to this growing inequality and how a lot of Americans, they're not really going to, to make the American dream. I wonder if you could tell us, I mean, how do you think that this, this uneven America will play out uh, uh, in, in its relationship with Mexico and Canada? Is this affecting us neighbors of the US? Well, you know, I don't like to give opinions about how people should conduct their business in the United States. Uh, no, uh, and of course it affects Mexico uh, in many ways. When uh, you see 
this uh, insufficient mobility you, you were referring to. When you see uh, real wages of uh, significant sectors of the American population uh, stagnant, when uh, you see income distribution not improving but deteriorating, and then all of that being associated somehow to questions like uh, NAFTA or to Mexican immigration into the United States, then I, as a, a person who claims to be a professional economist, uh, I, I get very concerned because I say, wait a minute, this is not about NAFTA, this is not about uh, uh, Mexican immigration, this is about something uh, that is decided by the political system of the United States. Because the same way that I was talking about the other things equal in Mexico, it's the same here. I mean, many of the effects that in the popular press or even by some analysts are imputed as effects or consequences of trade or engagement uh, of the United States in the international economy actually are man or policy design. Uh, and to that extent, that affects Mexico. Because when you uh, allow these wrong ideas, to permeate uh, the political culture, then, of course, it would be harder to pursue further integration with countries like Mexico, and more generally speaking, to continue pursuing uh, opening of this economy. Or there is even the risk that there will be a regression. I think it's very important to debate and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, what you are talking about is really the consequence, number one, probably of technological change. You know, there is a very strong element there. Uh, but of course, you don't want to stop uh, technological change. So if you don't like the consequences that we are seeing in the labor market uh, of a technological change, uh, then you have to pursue other public policies that will allow people uh, to continue uh, working uh, and participating in this vigorous uh, market economy. But this is not only about uh, speaking um, in economic jargon about uh, playing the game of Pareto optimality. This has to be translated into real, effective, committed, and well-financed public policies to level again the, the playing field in this great uh, market uh, economy. But I don't see that discussion really taking place, nor here, not uh, in other parts of the world. And that is very unfortunate. Uh, we have time for one last question, and I would like to offer the floor to another uh, distinguished graduate of the LBJ School, one of our very first PhD graduates, Professor Judith Mariscal of CIDE. Thank you, Jamie. Um, President Cedillo, you were talking about rule of law. It's so important in three conditions. I, I clearly think that's the one, you know, the single most important uh, factor that we need. And however, you talked about democracy, which we do have. And, and first, before my question, I just want to publicly acknowledge the key role you played in having that happen. You know, without you, I don't think the democracy would have had it. <laughs> but I have a very simple question it, that is more of a historical um, relevance, which we are integrated. I think Mexico and the US, mainly because of migration, is, is a very integrated region of the world. My question is why did telecommunications as basic telephony was not included in NAFTA? 
we already are integrated in, in telecommunications and voice and in equipment. But why I think of what I see in, in the document is that the three countries did not want basic telecommunications to come in. What is your perception? Well, uh, first, having her Rafael with his typical modesty, because I spoke about rule of law, and I uh, let me make a little commercial. Uh, Fernandez de Castro was uh, recently uh, an intellectual leader, a very important one, the intellectual leader of what I will call the most uh, important study about Latin America on the question of security and, and rule of law. So I hope tomorrow uh, you take a few minutes uh, to speak about uh, that uh, incredibly well done uh, and important study, because I think we need to, to discuss it more. We need to socialize it uh, in our countries, because it's, it's really uh, something very important. And, and I commend you for, for, for having had uh, the, that fantastic uh, leadership. Now, in the telecommunication sector, well, uh, I think every country has uh, its own uh, uh, reasons. Uh, in the case of Mexico at the time, you must remember that uh, the telecommunication sector was a government monopoly, a state monopoly. So the same way that we said the energy sector should not come into play, uh, I think we said we were in the transition to, to privatize. Uh, the telephone, the state telephone company. I think for the same reason, there was this uh, inhibition from our part, but also from the other parts to include it. I mentioned before that uh, one of the sectors where we should uh, consider enhancement of NAFTA is precisely in the telecommunications uh, uh, sector. I think that if and when uh, there are political circumstances to add more ambitious chapters to NAFTA, this will be a natural candidate. Mr. President, you, you showed your academic uh, instincts by making your original lecture correspond exactly to the length of a Yale class. Uh, <laughs> here in Texas, our classes run three hours, so we're approximately halfway through. Uh, well, but, you, we can tackle another topic. Uh, no, but, no. but in deference to the sensibilities of those educated in more delicate places, I think we are at our time. I, I, I would just say in, in closing, and to Peter would defer for a second, that uh, we encountered each other on one occasion at a birthday celebration at Columbia for Joe Stiglitz. And we were sitting side by side, uh, and Professor Solo of MIT, Robert Solo, was giving a, a paper which was not exactly flattering to the development of economics since the time we were in graduate school. Uh, and I made a, a, a comment about that to President Zedillo, and he said, uh, saying that I, I thought that if we could only close our eyes and, years for 30 years, that stuff would go away. And his response was, yes, it was a very good time to enter public service. <laughs> uh, and I would just say, in concluding and thanking you for your contribution tonight, the truer words were never said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, I will go to history for having said that. <laughs> <laughs>
the university has at least a delayed opening, even a closure. Your life is weather. I invite you to your life. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is we're not used to this. Um, uh, let me thank you all for coming, and let me just say, please do uh, take a look at the uh, uh, at the exhibit as you go out. These wonderful photographs, uh, uh, both today and then those of you here tomorrow as you come and go. Thank you once again. Thank you.